Good morning again. Hey, for those of you who were here last week on Friday, I watched Phil Fuller's message on the Good Samaritan and the guy rocked the house. I want you to, you need to show your gratitude to that guy. He did a fabulous job. In fact, one guy said, when I saw you weren't speaking, I was disappointed until I heard him and you can go away again. <laughs> but don't stay too long, you might not have a job when you come back. Uh, listen, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're, uh, the, the elders, we're, we want you to kind of get up to speed on where we plan to go from here concerning the name change process. So we will be uh, giving you some information. And, and then later on in this month, we're actually going to get a little bit of input from you, not a vote, but a survey concerning some name preferences and kind of get a feel for what your thinking is on that one. And then we'll proceed from there. So we just wanted to let you know that that will be coming a little later on in this month. I think the 23rd is when we'll actually do the survey, but we'll give you some information before that time too, okay? Uh, why, don't you, why don't you, let's pray again before we dive into this message. Lord, you wanted us badly to have this book and this word that was inspired by your spirit, and we would ask that the same spirit that inspired these words would illuminate our minds so that we receive what you want to give us. God, I confess that I'm not a perfect or pure vessel, but I pray that you cleanse me of my sin and speak through me this morning, and I would ask, God, that, that you make us all hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that everything you want to give, we would receive. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's kind of embarrassing, but I want you to actually raise your hands if this is true of you, okay? How many of you have ever had a cold or some kind of contagious condition that you passed on to someone else? Raise your hand, all right? I got, I got a little sick last year, and I gave it to my wife and just knocked her down. She didn't even like me for about a month because she got it bad. That's, that was negative influence. That's why they call the cold influenza, right? No, I'm lying to you. Just okay. I just want to see if you're tracking with me. That's negative influence, and, and we're all aware of what happens with peer pressure and how young people and maybe not so young people will be drawn into doing things or risking things or trying things or saying things because all their friends are doing it. That's why we have a verse in the Bible in, in, in Exodus chapter 23, I think it's at verse 2 or verse 5, I can't remember, verse 2, that says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Would you say those words with me? Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. In other words, just because everyone's doing it doesn't make it right. And besides, Jesus called us to be different, right? So we shouldn't just try to hide and blend in with the pack, right? We shouldn't try to look like the dogs if we're not like the dogs. There is a mystery to that image, so I want to see if you catch that. There was a delayed reaction on this side. Did you catch that? This side, oh, whatever, okay, whatever. But what we're going to talk about this morning isn't negative influence at all. We're going to talk about positive influence. Positive influence. Jesus Christ had amazing impact and positive influence on the human race and our history. And Jesus asks that his kingdom citizens or followers would also exert a certain kind of influence in the world in which we live. We should be in the world, not of it, but exerting influence. Now, let me give you a couple of working definitions so we can hang our hats on a couple of ideas, okay? First of all, influence is the power of persons or things to affect others. And all of us, whether we have official positions or big jobs or whatever, we all have influence on other people. Whether we use it correctly or not, it's a different issue, but we all have influence. And then impact is the power of a person, event, or idea to produce change. Jesus actually wants his kingdom citizens in this world where the kingdom of God has already been released into the bloodstream of the human race, he wants us to have both influence and impact on people that are in our realm of influence. He wants us to do that. And he's, he's going to actually describe that in two simple little parables or metaphors this morning. But if you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of Jesus' most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. He starts it with eight Beatitudes or kingdom servant attitudes. Uh, this is kind of a counterculture because what Jesus describes as happy or blessed, some people would say, really? But I want you to see what Jesus says here. I'm going to kind of put it in modern language. Jesus says, 
Blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you when you feel like you've lost what is most dear to you. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you when you're content with just who you are. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when you've worked up a good appetite for God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are you when you care. Blessed are the merciful. Happy are you when you get your inside world right. Blessed are the pure in heart. Happy or blessed are you when, when you help people cooperate instead of fight and compete. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then lastly, blessed are you when your commitment to Christ provokes persecution. Jesus said, blessed are you when you are insulted and, false, and, and, and falsely treated on account of me because uh, great is your reward in heaven. That's the way the prophets were treated, he says in verse 12, Matthew 5. And then after that, I want you to see this because there's a progression here. Jesus gives us this, these beatitudes or attitudes in the Christ follower's life. The last one is interesting because it pulls the trigger on the issue of persecution. You see, if we exert kingdom influence in the here and now, there will be some people that will not appreciate the way God wants things done. And hopefully it's not because we're obnoxious to our mannerisms, but because of who we follow, it could create friction and heat and anger and a negative response. And Jesus wants us to be okay with that because it's part of the price. Today it's fascinating. Our culture's telling Christians to shut up and keep it on Sundays. But Jesus says, don't go on the defense, stay on the offense. You be salt, you be light. You exert influence in your world until I come back to take you home. That's your role. And he gives us these two little metaphors, these two little living parables, homely little illustrations to describe the kind of influence we are to have in this world when he says you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. I, you know what? As I was studying for this, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if Jesus said you're the honey of the earth? Come here, honey. Or you're the milk of the earth. We all need milk. Little babies need milk. But Jesus doesn't pick those metaphors, honey and milk. It's the land of milk and honey. Jesus instead says, you are the salt. You are the light. Salt and light. Let's pick it up at verse 13, Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. These are powerful metaphors, powerful little parables about influence. And before I separate them and talk about salt and light, let me talk about them together in general. First, let me make three general observations. Observation number one is, is that both salt and light are fundamentally different from the mediums in which they are placed. Light is placed in darkness. Salt is applied in places that are saltless. And so the power of what occurs is when the diversity remains, when the difference is strong. If light becomes like darkness, there's no use in turning it on. If salt becomes so insipid that you can't taste it or it has no effect, it's no longer good. Which leads to my second observation, which is that, that salt and light must be administered to be of any value. Uh, you might want to write this in your sermon outlines. No contact, no impact. You got to turn on the light to diffuse the darkness and pierce it. You have to apply the salt to get the desired effect. There's a real application involved. And this is interesting because there is a part in all Christ's followers that would kind of retract from obeying him radically because of the cost involved. But Jesus clearly states and underlines in these little living parables that we are to be in the world but not of it. We are not to be like the world, but we are not to live in isolation in some evangelical ghetto or bubble. We are to have contact with the unbelieving world if we are going to impact it. No contact, no impact. And let's just, can we, can we talk 
for a second. The fear is always that if you have contact with a fallen world, it will have more influence on you than you have on it. And so the key to the Christian life is remaining in Christ and letting his life so flow through you that when you had contact with an unbelieving world, your influence on, the, on those around you is far greater than their influence on you. That is something Jesus Christ calls us to. Number three, our, realm, our primary realm of influence is among those we mix with on a regular basis. Uh, it's a little overwhelming when you hear you're the light of the world because who, who's little old me to affect the whole world? I have some people that write me notes as if I have a direct line to President Obama or the United Nations to be able to change the world. I can't do that. I can affect the world through prayer, but it feels a little overwhelming when you tell a believer, okay, just go change the world, okay? And that's why Jesus starts this whole thing by saying you're the salt of the earth. And the word that he chooses here is gase in the original language. And it means the dirt under your feet. Wiggle your toes for just a second on the ground, okay? It's the stuff right underneath your toes. It's your immediate realm of influence. It's the people at your school or your workplace or your grocery store or the gas station or your neighbors. It's the people that live in close proximity to you or somehow you have regular contact with. Jesus said, you're the salt of that realm of influence. That's doable. That's something we can do. And by the way, being salt and light is not so much something you do as something you are, as the life of Christ is released in you, as you take his words into your life, as you, as you yield to his spirit, as, as you seek to commune with other believers and live a serious spiritual life, the very life of Christ is formed in you and it comes out like salt and like light. So let's talk just a little bit about that because what we're talking about is being salt and light right here in the Elk Grove area. Getting our fingers into the Elk Grove area with direct influence wherever it is that you live or work, okay? So let's talk just a second about salt, okay? Salt. Uh, how much does a little thing of Morton salt cost in the store today? About a buck, right? I remember when it was way less. But salt in Jesus' day was a precious commodity. One of these things would have sold for hundreds of dollars in a modern market because people did not live in close proximity with salt and they didn't have modern day marketing. I'm gonna baptize the front row, be salted, okay? <laughs> salt was precious in the ancient world. In fact, Roman soldiers were often paid in salt rather than money because they could sell it for more. Think about this. No cars, no transportations. You live in Nebraska. Where are you going to get salt? You better have relatives in California. It was hard to come by. That's why you get the expression, the guy's not worth his salt. He's worthless, right? Unless you're worth like salt, you're worthless. And as you think about the scriptures, the scriptures are replete with, with illustrations about salt. For example, when people would make friendships or covenants in the Old Testament, they sealed it with a salt exchange. Even God with the house of David did. Second Chronicles says this, it says, don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever? How? By a covenant of salt. It was like this friendship salt exchange as God made a covenant with David. And salt was in the offerings. God apparently liked salty food. We're told in, in, in Leviticus chapter 2, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of the grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. God likes salty food. There you go. Hope my wife is listening. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a tidbit. This is it's totally irrelevant, but it, it's kind of funny and kind of sad at the same time. As God was about to rain down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah for their sexual perversity, he sent angels to help Lot and his family escape, but Lot's wife was really attached to Sodom. She turned back. Does anybody remember what happened to her when she turned back and looked at Sodom? She became a pillar of salt, right? She became the local salt lick for all the animals. You know, just no extra charge. Okay, stay with me, church. It's but in Jesus' day, salt was connected with purity. It was connected with healing. It was connected with creating thirst, 
preserving meats and other kinds of foods, adding flavor to food. There's a lot of punch with this metaphor. And I want to kind of walk you through the four primary things that we need to know about salt in order to understand the kind of permeating influence Jesus wants us to have in our immediate realm of influence, okay? So let's talk just a little bit about that. Number one, as we think of salt, we need to know that it assists in cleansing and healing. Salt assists in cleansing and healing. In the ancient world, they didn't have all the modern medicines, and so if you went to the medicine chest in Jesus' day, there'd be a bag of salt in there. It was bright white as a symbol of purity, but it also had anesthetic principles and was used a lot in helping people. For example, in, in, ex, in Ezekiel chapter 16, it's kind of a weird custom and we don't do it today, but when babies were born, they would wash them in salt water and then rub salt on their skin. It was a disinfectant in case there was any diseases or infections. They wanted to protect the children from that when they were vulnerable and first born. They'd rub them down with salt. You just rub your baby with salt, you weird. But that's what they did. Even today, when we have a sore throat, we'll get some warm water and we'll put mm in it and gargle. What do we put in it? Salt. salt. It's not a wives' tale. It actually works. You've got a sore throat, you gargle with salt water, and it'll help you with the yuckety doodahs in there, right? It will actually clean out bacteria. It's an antiseptic. I, how many of you have ever experienced going into salt water with a cut or open wound? You've done it? Oh, man. I grew up in Huntington Beach, four boys. We always had cuts. And I remember when we would go throw our bodies in the Pacific Ocean and that, that salt water would get into the cut and it just really hurts, right? You could just feel it even as I'm talking about it. But then uh, my skin, <laughs> I remember some of that pain. It would get rid of the infection. The salt would clean out the wound and it would actually cauterize it and it would heal faster. There's actually a medicinal healing principle built in to the simple compound of sodium chloride salt. Salt assists in cleansing and healing. Gosh, I remember when I, not just the ocean, but I remember when I floated on the Dead Sea for the first time. There's Uncle Scott on the Dead Sea. It's 10 times saltier. I know that's a disturbing picture, don't look. It's 10 times saltier than the ocean. And I forgot that I had a cut on my leg. And I went in there and I and I, as I rolled over to grab my leg, I put my head under the water and opened my eyes. <laughs> I am as dumb as I look, huh? Gosh, don't do that. By the way, we are going there on our trip to Israel. I think there's like eight more places left on our trip to Israel. Two people signed up this morning, but we still have just a few places left. In May of next year, we're going to take a trip to the Holy Land. That's... Uh, that's just shameless PR, isn't it? But coming back to this issue of salt leading to healing and cleansing, I want you, the take home is this. Our presence among other people, our mannerisms, our words, our, our ways need to be, move towards healing. They need to move towards cleansing. They need to move towards restoration. They need to move towards forgiveness. They need to move towards resolution of complex interpersonal dynamics and problems. We are to bring healing. And, and it isn't so much what you do as how, how you do it that often assists in that healing process. And boy, does the world need that kind of salt today because we are messed up. We're not only fractured and fragmented from God, we're fractured and fragmented from each other. But salt assists in cleansing and healing. Number two, salt creates thirst. This is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, in, in the Central Valley, folks, uh, when it's really hot outside, uh, you know how you remind people that they need to drink more fluids? Give them more salty food. Give them salt tablets. You've heard the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a horse drink. Well, give the sucker some salty snacks on the way, and we'll see how that one plays out, right? Because you just get, have you ever had a mouth full of too much salt? What do you want to do? Eat crackers? No, you want to drink water. You want to kind of neutralize it. It creates thirst. Uh, this Jesus Christ, I want you to think about him. He's like the, the, the perfect thirst creator. When Jesus was addressed, people would, would have come to him with all kinds of problems, and he would ask questions and create spiritual thirst, more curiosity, draw people out of themselves. 
He was just great at this. Jesus' presence was so salty in this regard. I remember there's a guy that wrote a book called Joel Aldrich. He wrote a book called Lifestyle Evangelism. And in that, he had a neighbor. I can't remember what his neighbor's friend was. But he decided to kind of torment his neighbor and create thirst in his neighbor. So let's call his neighbor Fred. He said, hey, Fred, someday when we both have time, I want to talk to you about the seven secrets of a successful life. But I don't have time right now, so we'll get back to that, okay? Then he walked, he was jogging by his house the next day. He said, hey, Fred, good to see you. Don't forget to remind me to talk to you about the seven secrets of a successful life. This went on for like two or three months. Fred finally came over, wrapped his arms or his hands around the guy's neck and said, tell me the secrets about a successful life. Because he created thirst. Created thirst. I, I don't do this very often, but I did do this one time. I'll admit it. I usually like to give people opportunities to come to Christ. But I was teaching at a camp in southern Italy, and I knew I had about 100 young people for the whole week. So the first couple of days, we were just doing gospel, 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 gospel. I said, now, I'm not ready to let you ask Christ into your life yet. So don't do it. But I want you to think about it, about gaining eternal life and having your whole life transformed. But don't do it yet. I'm not ready to help you cross the line of faith yet. So we'll talk about it later. I did that about five times a day for three days. There's this guy by the name of Rosario. I knew that about 30 of those kids were lost. He came up to me on day four and he said, would you please lead me to faith in Jesus Christ? Right now! I said, no, not ready. <laughs> Add flavor, make things thirsty. We have to be a little more creative. Salt creates thirst. Number three, salt also uh, slows down decay and corruption. And you go, what? This may be one of the primary things Jesus was hinting at when he said you're the salt of the earth. Newsflash, no refrigeration in Jesus' day. So if you wanted to preserve food, you would have to take salt, particularly meats and certain vegetables, and you'd rub that salt all over the meat. You guys ever eaten beef jerky? You know what beef jerky is? It's cured meat with salt rubbed in. And that way they could preserve it. The putrefaction process of the meat slowed down. They could have their food a little later on. And I think this is one of those things where Jesus wants us to get this, that there is a spiritual component where we delay decay, where the moral corruption and pollution that's taking place in our world, it isn't stopped in its tracks, but it's slowed down by our very presence. This may seem a bit negative, but in a wicked world where evil constantly desires to suck us downward toward the pit, Christ followers are meant to have the influence of being a moral disinfectant, kind of a break on the advance of immorality. We won't stop it completely. We can slow it down. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but some people don't appreciate that with Christ followers because they'd prefer to sin without anybody stirring their conscience about it. And so it could cause friction, but it is something Jesus asks of us. You are the salt of the earth. My daughter works at Tahoe Joe's to supplement her family's income. Uh, she's coming up to the third service with the two boys, so I'm pretty excited about that. But uh, Jenny is like a fire-breathing dragon for Jesus. She's a very, very delightful Christ follower. But the conversation among the waiters and waitresses at Tahoe Joe can get a little saucy at times, a little sordid, and kind of go into the cesspool a bit and some of the things they do in their lifestyle choices. But when she comes to work, they all adjust their conversation. They stop cursing. They stop using filthy illustrations of what they think is wonderful because she's salt in her workplace and she slows down the moral corruption of what's happening in that culture. I was with a group of people. I remember this is so funny. There's five or six people and one of them was cussing like a sailor. And, and the other one, Elvin, he said, shh, that guy's a pastor. <laughs> and I looked at the guy straight in his face and I said, that's right. And if you don't shut up, I'm going to tell God. As if he doesn't already know, right? Newsflash, you can't hide from God. Everything you say gets recorded. But you can't slow down the evil. I know we've got a lot of problems in our world, but think about how much worse it would be if you removed the church on issues like abortion, and now they're harvesting organs and fetal tissue from aborted children and euthanasia. They'd be killing off the seniors. Sex trafficking would be like just... The church doesn't stop this stuff, but it holds it back 
from completely causing the world to implode. Salt is useful for slowing down decay and corruption. This is my favorite one. Salt adds flavor. Salt adds flavor. In fact, in Job chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Is tasteless food eaten without salt? Or is the, there flavor in the white of an egg? Have you ever tried to eat the white part of an egg without putting anything on it? You know what it tastes like? It tastes like something English people would eat. You know, it just, it's just weird. If you're British, I'll give you a dollar after the service. I'm sorry. In fact, just get the dollar from your neighbor right now. They like me, and so they'll give it to you. Nobody wants to eat the white of an egg without salt on it. And nobody really knows how salt actually works. We just put it on. We know that it does work, right? And, uh, for example, French fries. I'm doing this for you. French fries. Have you ever tried to eat French fries without salt? Again, I'm doing this for you. Besides, it's the third service and I'm hungry. Oh, they didn't salt them. Nah. French fries without salt. It's yucky. But the trick, there is a trick. Pay attention, no extra charge. Is that you gotta get just the right amount of salt on them. Not too much, not too little. If you put too much on them, oh! But if you put too little on them, oh! So you gotta get just. Just the right amount of. Just, just, just a little. Just a. Because if you get too much on them, whoa, they're no good. Do you get the point, church? That's why Jesus doesn't want all the salt together all the time in church. Because we're like manure. We're no good until we're spread around. And don't go telling your friends our pastor called us manure, okay? But you get the point. You can't put all the salt in one place or you wreck it. You got to spread it out and get it just right. Not too much, not too little. There's a Bible verse in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says this. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Isn't that interesting? It actually says that. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so even in our conversations, we're supposed to be salty inserting little spiritual observations and questions and stirring up interest. We add flavor to this world. This world, quite frankly, without our presence is pretty bland. We add flavor to it. What a wonderful task. Now, here's where the problem enters. What if, and Jesus presents this possibility, what if salt loses its saltiness? What if salt loses its saltiness? Read the text. It says in verse 13, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So what if we pour this salt out one day and it no longer adds flavor, it no longer creates thirst, it no longer cleanses and heals, it no longer uh, slows down decay or the putrefaction of food? What good is it then? It's useless. It's cursed. You can't even throw it on your garden. You'll ruin the soil in your garden. You have to open your front door, just toss it out on the street to be pulverized by the passers-by and just become street dust because it's worth less than nothing if it loses its saltiness. Boy, talk about a graphic warning Jesus is giving to his followers. Don't lose your saltiness. Don't become worthless. Now, some people have attacked the Bible on this illustration. Because if you're a scientist, you'll know this. Salt is a compound of two things. It's called sodium chloride, and it is one of the most stable compounds on Earth. Salt does not lose its saltiness. So they're saying, see, Jesus doesn't understand salt, but you have to consider the cultural context. The Jewish people got their salt from the marshes in the southern part of the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, and that salt had impurities in it. 
it was a it was a bizarre admixture of gypsum and salt and other white elements that all looked like salt, but they were not all salt. And so the alkaline could fall in it, it could become insipid, and the salt in Jesus' day actually could lose its saltiness. So the people completely understood this risk of salt losing its saltiness. But once again, it brings us back to the question, are you salty salt? Really, that's, that's where I want to go with this one. Are you salty salt with those in your immediate realm of influence? Do you, by your very presence, your actions, your words, do you bring cleansing and healing into relationships? Do you create thirst? Do you slow down the moral and spiritual decay around you? Do you add flavor to the lives of other people by your very presence and your witness and your words, your example, the things you do? Are you salty salt? <clears throat> because Jesus has called us to be salty salt. In fact, all that salt created thirst. Oh. Now, let's talk about light. Jesus says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. And a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. In the ancient world, even today, light is, is a symbol of the best of knowledge, the best of understanding. It is the best of an illuminated mind and spirit concerning truth. In fact, light is a perfect symbol of the revealed will or truth of God. Scripture is considered light because it is God revealing himself to the human race. Light has two primary functions. It illuminates and it exposes. In fact, one of the best Bible commentaries on this is the Gospel of John, chapter 3. So I want you to turn there. Go, go from Matthew through Mark, Luke to John, chapter 3. And we're going to look at what Jesus says about this tension between light and darkness, okay? John chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 19. Here's what Jesus says. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Do you catch this? illuminating and exposing. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen, lost my page, so that it may be seen plainly that what he or she has done has been done through God. There's that tension of light illuminating and exposing at the same time. Um, light is good for truth seekers, but light is not so good for moral cockroaches. Are you with me, church? If you really don't want to get caught, you'd prefer dark. When do thieves normally steal? At nighttime. Not always, but it's a little easier to hide. Let me uh, make just a simple clarification before we move on with this light metaphor. Uh, you and I don't actually exude life. We transmit light. We reflect light. Have you been noticing the blue moon the last couple of nights? If you haven't, you need to go out and see it. It's amazing. It only happens once every two years or so, but uh, it's not literally blue, but it's incredibly clear, the face of the moon. Uh, so c is it true that the moon gives light? It is not true that the moon gives light, except in a metaphorical sense. The moon reflects light. It reflects the light of the sun. And in the same way, Jesus is really the sun, S-O-N, shining his light on us, and we reflect it like mirrors. We reflect it or transmit it. We don't exude it. Jesus himself is actually the light of the world. He's told us in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. And then the next chapter, in verse 5, he says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But the problem is, Jesus is no longer physically in the world. He ascended back to heaven in Acts chapter 1. But his body is still here. His body is who? 
His body is all who follow him and love him and bow down to him as the king of the kingdom. We are his body, and so we don't give light, but we can transmit it and reflect it because the source is strong. In that sense, you and I are the light of the world. So let's talk about it just a second. Light, we already said, uh, the first function of light is, is that it illuminates the right path. This is the positive aspect of light. The parable states that when you have a radiant city up on a hill, even when there's no street lights and the, the stars are, are gone, people can migrate towards that light because that light kind of shows them the way. It gives them their destination. In the same way, you take a little lantern and you put it up at a place in the house so that it lights up the room so that everybody knows how to go about their business and find what they need to find. You ever played that game where you turn off all the lights and walk around the house, or you close your eyes, or the electricity's out, and you try to navigate in pitch dark? Have you ever tried that? Come on, don't lie to me. Come on, we have to have some fun in life, right? You walk around. It's fun until you stub your toe, and then the game's over, right? And you turn the lights back on because you can't live without light. You have to have light. You have to have eyes. I mean, the whole thing is amazing how God's designed light. But you have to have light. We're told in the Bible in Psalm 119 that your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. The very words of God, the very indwelling life of Christ, the indwelling of his spirit in us leads us towards the right path. His word, his presence, his spirit, they move us towards the right path, and they move us to avoid the wrong paths. Light helps illuminate the right path. And boy, in that sense, Jesus doesn't save you from one hell. He saves you from thousands of hells by showing you the right path. And that's the positive feature of light. That's the part that I like a lot. But there's also the negative part of light because some don't appreciate the right path. They want to continue on in their evil. Remember John 3? They preferred the darkness because their deeds were evil. Those people are not going to appreciate this secondary function of light because as I said already before, light doesn't just illuminate the right path. It also exposes wrong paths. It has to by its very nature. And I know there's a lot of us that would prefer that not be true. But light is not just a guide. It's also a warning. It's like the lighthouse that's good for ships that avoid the rocks, but it's bad for ships that blow it off. Light illuminates the right path. Light exposes the wrong paths. Let me read something to you. I'm just going to read it to you. It's in your sermon outline. You can find it. But in Ephesians 5, it says, You were once darkness, but now you were light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the, fruit, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. That's such a beautiful expression. Find out what pleases God. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. Light illuminates the right path. Light exposes the wrong paths. And some Christ followers would prefer that not be in our job description because when you turn the light on and there's people doing things they don't want to be caught doing, they probably won't appreciate you very much. There will be friction and heat and perhaps even persecution birthed out of that. Now, you don't want to ever face persecution because your mannerisms are rude or because you're not humble or gentle, but light by its very nature exposes wrong paths and there is little you can do about that. That is who you are as a Christ follower. You need to be okay with that. Do I enjoy that? No. Am I okay with it? Yeah, I'm okay with it. It's just part of the price. We're told here that you don't take light and hide it under a bushel basket, right? You guys know that little Sunday school song? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. The second verse goes, hide it under a bushel. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let's try that again. Hide it under a bushel. 
I'm going to let it shine. You know why you wouldn't hide your light under a bushel? Because it's stupid. There are two distinct reasons you wouldn't do it. First reason is it would run out of oxygen and go out. Or it would catch the bushel on fire and burn it up. Light by its very nature should not be hidden. Oh, but I can't talk about God at work. I might get in trouble. Really? It might be against the law at school to talk about God. So? <laughs> Read Acts chapter 4. Peter says, Well, you deem whether it's right for us to obey the laws of God rather than the laws of men. But we're going with God. There are some times when civil disobedience is appropriate, folks. You don't hide light. By its very nature, you put it up where it can be useful and people can benefit from it. That's why God wants to expose us to the world, even though we may not want that. God wants us to shine. In, um, I, there's a great passage. I'm just going to read it. I'll read it to you. In Philippians, it's a cool little one. It gets me in trouble from time to time, but the Bible does that. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's in there somewhere. I'll find it. It's in this book somewhere. I really like it. I read it once. Oh, listen. Do, this is Philippians 2.14. Do everything without complaining and arguing. <laughs> Put that one up at your home. <laughs> Do everything without complaining or arguing. <laughs> gotcha. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that... You may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Wow. God says, kids, shine. Go on and shine. Let me show you something. This is, the, this is how, uh, that's the Ephesian passage. This is, a, this is a lamp that would have been common in Jesus' day, okay? They didn't have light bulbs. They didn't have electricity. So... These common clay lamps, they find them, the archaeologists find them everywhere. I own two or three of them in my office as well. Really common. And this is how it worked. The, the, the lamp was often only about this big, right here, okay? And they would pour oil in the center part. They'd push a wick through that little opening there in the end, and it would go all the way down to the oil. The oil would then climb up the wick, and as soon as you strike the spark at the tip of the wick that has the oil in it, you get a flame that creates light, okay? This is how they lit up their homes. This is how they lit up their offices. When it was dark, this is what they did. Now, here's the principle I want you to get. There is a cost in being an influence for Jesus Christ. There's a cost for being light and salt. In the case of the lamp, the wick would burn up in the process, and the oil would go down in the process. You lose oil and wick. The wick would have to be trimmed or the light would be smoky. So as we burn for Jesus Christ, we get consumed in the process. Same thing with salt. Salt has to be used in the process. Are you okay with that? All of us give our lives to something, right? We're not going to live forever in this world. So what are you giving your life to? See, Jesus is really inviting us to give our life to the ultimate cause that dignifies our life and gives us purpose. Give yourself to the kingdom of God, promoting the kingdom of God, living for God, representing God well, shining, being salty. Let yourself be consumed for me. You're going to be consumed anyways. You might as well be consumed for the right reason. Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says something brilliant. He says, I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well in 2 Corinthians 12, 15. To be effective, salt must be used up. To give light, olive oil and the wick must be burned up. And Jesus is asking us, he's actually saying, it's not so much what we do as who we are when we abide in the vine, right? That we will be salt, we will be light, we will have a certain exerted kingdom influence on the people in our immediate realm of influence if we walk in close step with him. We will be salty, we will shine. And when that happens, and you see this in verse 16 too, people will notice. Let your light so shine, your good works so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify you? No. 
they glorify your Father who is in heaven. Because again, we don't exude light, we reflect light. So when honor comes our way, we reflect it back onto God as well. Because quite frankly, now you've probably had this happen to you. You do something really cool because the Spirit of God is in you and people want to give you the credit. Oh, would you not take the credit for that? People say, oh man, you're just an amazing human being. I said, really? Ask my wife. No, it's God at work in me. It's God. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. How do you apply a text like this? I mean, I could say a bunch of things. I'm only going to say two things. Uh, application point, well, first before I even give you a point, is I just want you to know God has no plan B in this influence thing. It's you and me. We're his salt, we're his light. That's it. He's not going to send angels to do this work. He's not going to send some weird race of Martians down here to get it done because we didn't get it done. He wants us to be salt and light. He wants us to introduce people to his transforming, amazing love that makes people whole and reconnects them with their maker. We're it. We're plan A, and there is no plan B. So application number one this morning is, is that people will not be saved by abstract truth, but by truth embodied. You could just as easily replace the word truth with love there. That people will not be saved by abstract love, but by love embodied. People need truth and love, and they need it in human skin. They, they need us to show them what it means to live under the influence and power and sovereignty of a different king marching to a different drum. They've got to see it happening in our speech, in the way we raise our kids, in the way we spend our money, in the way we drive, in the way we work, in the way we go about life. They've got to see that it matters. Again, there is no plan B. We are God's hands. We are God's feet. He gets his work done through you and through me. Secondly, by way of application, is, is that there must be something marked, distinct, and peculiar about our character and lifestyle if we are to have kingdom influence now. We have to keep our unique difference. You see, if this person obeys and responds to life based on a worldview system that is apart from God, we can expect a certain consistency with their assumptions and their words and their behavior. But if this person is submitted to the King of Kings, do you think their lifestyle will be different than this person? You would hope so, right? We need to be different because we follow a different Lord. And the greater our, the distinction there, not in being weird, but being holy and righteous, the greater that distinction, the more powerful the impact when the light is turned on and when the salt is applied. We said that at the beginning of this message as well. Salt needs to stay pure, uncontaminated and salty in order to have a powerful impact when it makes contact. Light cannot and should not be hidden. It needs to burn pure. It needs to be lifted up, shining to the benefit of those around. So what did I say this morning? Jesus Christ has just beautifully explained the kind of influence through a couple of parables, a couple of metaphors, the kind of influence his followers should have in their immediate realm of influence. And he did it with basically two words. You are the mm and you are the mm. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So be salty and shine. Let's call our ushers forward. We're going to receive our, our morning tithes and offerings. And I'm going to pray, and then we'll go back to worship, okay? Father, thank you this morning for this word. It was, it was so simple. Jesus, you were so good at communicating so much with so little. And God, I know people are going to walk out of this room this morning, and they're not going to remember everything I said, but by your spirit, that one thing they needed to hear that they need to integrate in their life, I just want to pray that you that you let your spirit massage that into their lives so that they own it. And God, we would pray that just as Jesus was wonderful salt and light and continues to be wonderful salt and light in our lives, that we would also become salt, better salt, better light in the lives of those in our immediate realm of influence. And we pray this in the strong name of Mr. Salty and Lighty himself, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.